And so, uh, yeah, thank you both. Uh, so I wanted to start by acknowledging that we are on the, on the ancestral and traditional homelands of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, uh, the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida, the Appalachee, the Seminole and Muscogee Nations, and others. Uh, and I also wanted to acknowledge that I did most of this work at the University of Illinois, uh, which is on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Pankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. So my work is in academia, mostly in teaching, training, and research. Uh, and does not directly involve on the ground action to help Native nations realize self-determination. Uh, but I do work with uh, organizations that do do this work, and so I just wanted to mention them. Uh, the Native American Rights Fund, uh, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and Native Biodata Consortium. Uh, they all have websites. If you go into Google and type them in, you can go check out their websites. Uh, and um, if uh, you're so inclined, they do accept donations. So um, I'm going to spend a fair amount of my t time during this presentation talking about a program that I co-founded in 2010 called the SING program, or the uh, Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics. Now, this is a training program for indigenous students and community members taught by mostly indigenous scholars and scientists and folks like myself who are non-indigenous to the Americas. Uh, but have had long-standing relationships with indigenous communities in North America. Uh, my heritage is uh, Punjabi Sikh. Um, uh, my parents migrated from northern Punjab to the U.S. in the late 60s. Now, while I expected Singh to have a strong impact, I didn't realize uh, in the beginning how profoundly it would change my perception and practice of science. So my, re my research area is in anthropological genomics, uh, which has emerged from what um, used to be called physical anthropology, uh, but is now largely called biological anthropology. Uh, so in this presentation, along with dis discussing the SING program, I'm going to discuss uh, my um, changing research practices um, over the past 25 years uh, to um, be more inclusive and equitable. So here's just a quick outline of my presentation. Um, since it's going to be over 40 minutes, I always like to just give people an idea of where I'm going to be going. So I'm going to first talk about uh, kind of an overview of um, physical biological anthropology. Then I'll talk about the SING program. And then I'll give an example of community-engaged research from my lab uh, that took place in, in California. So uh, let's first go back to talk about the history of physical anthropology. Uh, and uh, I'm sure most of you recognize uh, this person, Dr. Alice Herlichka, uh, who many consider to be the father of physical anthropology. Uh, he founded the flagship journal uh, for biological anthropology, the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, in 1918. And then about a decade later, uh, he founded the American Association of Physical Anthropology. Right. Um, so. Herlichka is well known for his human osteological collections at the Smithsonian, uh, but he is less well known uh, until recently, there have been a few articles that have come out recently, about how he procured some of the individuals in his collection. And so I just wanted to give uh, one example here. And it was in 1902 when 100 Yaqui community members in Sonora, Mexico, uh, were slaughtered by government troops um, and Herlichka was informed about this attack by government officials. Uh, a month later, uh, Herlichka visited the, the site of the battle, uh, and the bodies of individuals were still lying um, uh, on the ground there. And Herlichka was able to go and uh, collect 12 skulls by removing uh, the heads, preparing them, and sending them back to the Smithsonian. Uh, pretty horrific. Right. Uh, so it wasn't until over 100 years later in 2019 uh, that there was a success, successful effort uh, by the Yaqui to repatriate and rebury these 12 individuals 
uh, who received a traditional burial ceremony. Right. And so I'm giving this as a prime example of settler colonial violent efforts um, that work closely with Western science in the 19th century or the 20th century, probably 19th century as well. Uh, and so this is not a unique example. This, uh, there I could give other examples of this. Um, but this is the history of the, the field that uh, I practice in. Uh, Herlichka was also a eugenicist and a white supremacist. Right? Uh, so now, these days, how is the field of physical anthropology contending with this history? Right? It's a question. I know that we have a few uh, biological anthropologists here in the audience, so I'm going to make this a little bit interactive. Uh, so uh, uh, you, you biological anthropologists, uh, just quickly some thoughts on things that you've seen recently about how our field is dealing with this history. Sorry, Anne, to put you on the spot. <laughs> Yes, I think there are a number of movements that have had some effort and maybe have had some success, but uh, overall I think there's still a lot to do. Uh, one thing that the association has done is they have changed their name from the uh, American Association of Physical Anthropology or Anthropologists to the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. Now, this is not to erase the history of Herlichka and his horrific practices, uh, but I think it is, uh, uh, I think if you went and talked to a biological anthropologist, they would acknowledge this history, but then say, yes, that is different from what we're doing now. And so the name change recognizes this change in practice and what were our efforts and our ideas now. Right. Maybe some uh, some change that is positive coming from this, maybe not, still waiting to see. Uh, an area that I think has had been much more um, effective is that um, a program that along with my um, uh, uh, experience with the SING program, I worked with uh, some people at the American Association of Biological Anthropology to found the IDEAS program, uh, which is Increasing Diversity in Evolutionary Anthropological Sciences. And now this is a program targeted for uh, BIPOC students and scholars that are interested in biological anthropology. Uh, and so a day before the meetings, uh, we get together. Uh, it's uh, students at the undergrad level, graduate student level, postdocs, as well as uh, faculty at all levels. And we have a meeting just to warm up to um, uh, the, the main meetings that will happen over the next few days. Uh, that is largely a, a white space, right? And so we talk what it's about, what it's like to, to work at institutions that, as um, uh, a BIPOC um, person and in this area of research. And so we talk about ways of uh, making science more inclusive, um, things that we can do, um, and we build basically a support network for um, people of color in, interested in biological anthropology. Uh, it's been pretty successful. Uh, we've had over 80 um, participants in the program, and it's just been renewed for another four years by uh, NSF. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to make a plug here because I know we have some uh, um, Students in the audience, uh, if you have an interest in this program, it's not too late. You can apply. Um, the deadline is not until November 1st. So if you just go to bioanth.org, um, if you, um, you can go there and fill out an application. Right? So uh, if you know of students that would be interested in this, please pass this message along. OK, so now I want to um, just go back in time to when I was in graduate school at the University of California, Davis from uh, 1996 to 2001. Uh, here's a, a photo of me back then. 
I know what you're thinking. I haven't aged at all. Right? Um, so I grew up maybe 40 minutes north of uh, Davis in a town called Yuba City that has a large uh, Punjabi population uh, because of the, the farming in the area. Right? And so uh, I went pretty close from to um, undergrad and graduate school um, uh, near my hometown. Uh, and so I, for graduate school, I joined Dr. David Glenn Smith's laboratory uh, in molecular anthropology. And my research was focused on looking at DNA variation among indigenous peoples' um, uh, uh, samples of, of blood for genetic diversity and to infer population history right, from, from looking at that genetic diversity using population genetics techniques um, along with other anthropological information. And so for my first four years of graduate school, my interaction with um, indigenous peoples uh, was not, was pretty much non-existent. It was largely this, right? My advisor had gone and he had collected samples um, from various communities and worked with other uh, anthropologists to get samples from uh, indigenous communities, and he had freezers full of samples. Right? And so my job for the first few years was to learn how to do molecular biology, extract DNA from these samples, sequence parts of the DNA, uh, look at the diversity, and use population genetic techniques to infer population history. Right? And so I did think it was strange that I um, was someone who had never met any individuals in these communities yet I was training to be the expert on their population history. But this was the norm at the time. Right? There was a paper that came out in the year 2000 uh, called Freezer Anthropology, New Uses for Old Blood. Right? And in this paper, in a prestigious journal, the Royal Society, uh, the author um, recognized that there had been uh, generations of anthropologists um, that have gone out, collected blood samples, uh, brought them back and stored them, uh, originally for blood group analysis or protein analysis, that can now be used for uh, DNA sequencing and DNA analysis. Right? And he advocated that you know, some of these samples could be 35 years old, but you could still use them to address your hypotheses without any engagement with the, the communities. Right? This was what was happening uh, around the year 2000. Right. This is also the time around uh, the ancient one, also known as Kennewick Man, uh, when uh, an ancient, an ancestor was uncovered on the Columbia River uh, that was nearly complete uh, and wasn't a recent individual, but dated back to over 8,000 years ago. Uh, and the uh, local indigenous communities wanted to repatriate and rebury their ancestor, but scientists sued and said, no, you cannot repatriate and rebury. This is uh, a national treasure, and we have the right to study this individual. And so this is kind of the, the culture when I went to grad school of, of what it was like um, for doing this type of work. Uh, so around 2000, 2001, uh, I had some data. I was giving local talks, and there was an indigenous archaeologist who actually invited me to uh, come to her reservation and give a presentation. Uh, and maybe I would um, be able to collect samples from, from community members. And so I quickly filed the IRB paperwork that I needed to go uh, um, that I needed to do in order to uh, collect samples um, from individuals. I, I grabbed a bunch of cheek swabs um, and I drove to Round Valley Reservation, which is about two, three hour drive from Davis in Northern California. Uh, and so I went to uh, meet um, my, my colleague and I gave a talk in a um, community building to maybe a dozen individuals. I even showed them the cheek swabs, and I was like, you don't have to do blood draws anymore. All you gotta do is just rub this cheek inside, uh, rub this inside your cheek, and you can give a sample. It's that easy. Uh, why wouldn't you wanna participate? Right. 
Uh, and so then after my talk, I said, are there any questions? And it was silence for what seemed to be, in my mind, years. <laughs> it was actually just a few seconds. And then there was an elder who raised his hand, hand and I said, oh, great, yeah, what's your question? And his, uh, his question changed the direction of my career forever. He said, why should I trust you? And I said, oh, I'm a trustworthy guy. You know, talk to my family, talk to my friends. You, they'll, they'll vouch for me. And then he realized that in it, I did not understand his question. And he stood up slowly and he said, let me tell you some history. And he basically described helicopter research, uh, extractive science. And he talked about researchers coming to Dative communities, taking what they needed and then leaving, never coming back to report on results, uh, never coming back to give updates on what was happening or any kind of information after they got what they needed. Right? And so I was shocked. Right? I was like, okay, I know that is not the type of research that I wanted to want to do. Uh, but I, that's the only type of research that I was trained to do. I didn't have any uh, models of people doing different types of research that I could follow right, at that time. Uh, until a few years later, when I started to work with Dr. Jerry Sobolski, who was a curator at the Museum of Civilizations. So Dr. Sobolski uh, worked at the Museum of Civilizations, which is kind of the Smithsonian of, of Canada, as uh, some Canadians in the audience can tell you. Uh, and so he had been working with uh, First Nations for, at that time, 25, 30 years. Uh, and there's, there's uh, Jerry right there with one of our community collaborators, Harold Harry. Uh, and it was Jerry that I began to learn about community-engaged research because um, he would go to the communities every year, report on his latest results, talk to them about what they wanted to learn, why they wanted to, to learn about it, and work with them to find a pre appropriate people to help the community um, do what they needed or what they wanted to do. Uh, and so he had a project with uh, uh, communities, uh, First Nations on the interior of British Columbia, and they had uncovered uh, some ancestors uh, that uh, were in a recreational park that dated to about uh, four or 5,000 years ago. Uh, and they had heard about this thing called ancient DNA and paleo, well, it wasn't paleogenomics yet, ancient DNA research. Uh, and so uh, he said, well, I can find someone to come talk to you about ancient DNA research because they had an interest in seeing if they could connect present day community members to ancestors uh, using DNA research. Right. And so Jerry got in touch with me at the time. And so he said, hey, do you wanna come up and talk to these First Nations about your work? I said, sure. Great. Uh, and so I went up, talked. Uh, we uh, went through appropriate channels. We had to get permissions from tribal council first. And then we were able to talk to the entire community and uh, eventually ask for volunteers uh, for this research project. And so uh, the community members trusted Jerry, right? And that trust was placed in me as well because of their trust in Jerry. And so I, I held this kind of sacred, right? Uh, and it was through these, this type of work with, with Jerry, uh, first on the interior and then on the coast of British Columbia, that I learned some you know, partnership principles that should sound pretty familiar because they are the principles of the Belmont Report, uh, respect, mutual benefit. Um, I added transparency because we, uh, that's, a, I think, a form of respect, where we would go back to the community, report our latest results, ask them what they thought about the patterns that we were seeing, uh, ask for their knowledge about what um, they thought we were missing. And we would do that over and over again until it was time to work with them to write up a publication, which they got credit for um, as co-authors, and then we would publish. Right. So uh, this was great. I was feeling like, oh, I'm no longer doing extractive science. Wonderful. 
But then I thought about it some more, especially when I first started at the University of Illinois um, around 2006, 2007, and I was like, you know, it's still me going to the communities and the, and the members and being like, how about doing this research? How about doing that? You could do this as well. And you know, I was like, what about this? And it was still seemed to be me driving the research questions and not the community. Uh, and it was that, at that point that I started talking with Robert Warrior, who was a director of American Indian Studies uh, program on campus at the time, and uh, a few co colleagues that I had created, uh, like uh, Dr. Kim Talbert, who was at uh, UC Berkeley at the time. Uh, and uh, we uh, decided that we could do better. And one way we could do better was creating this SING program. Uh, that started in 2011 uh, and uh, has been going on ever since, uh, almost annually. Um, we had two years of uh, online during the pandemic, uh, and then it was just this last summer where we were able to, um, to meet again in Flagstaff and uh, meet with uh, Navajo Nation folks on the program. So I just wanted to go through and give you kind of a sense of what the SYNC program is. It's a week-long program uh, where we have anywhere between 15 and 30 participants. If you get accepted into the program, all of your expenses are paid for travel, accommodations, food. Uh, you get a stipend. Uh, faculty are mostly, as I said, indigenous scholars or scientists and folks like myself who sometimes would get a small honorarium at first, but then as Time went on, we were able to obtain more money, um, had um, uh, uh, better honorariums for the, for the hard work that they were doing. Uh, and so we had different modules uh, that were hands-on in the program. So a lot of this work took, took place at the Institute for Genomic Biology, where there's a teaching wet lab. So um, students could extract their own DNA and sequence it uh, if they wanted to. Uh, if they didn't want to, uh, they could you know, use uh, TA's DNA or just watch someone else. Uh, and so they learn the techniques of what you actually do in the lab. Uh, and then once we um, were able to talk about uh, mitochondrial DNA and the ancestry, we talked about um, reductionism and essentialism and how identity is not biology. And there's much more to identity than biology and had conversations about that. Uh, we had bioinformatics modules. Right next door, there's a computer lab uh, where programs can be uploaded. And uh, this is Mike DiGiorgio teaching uh, one of the labs where he was able to uh, have students recreate um, figures where they analyze DNA markers of hundreds of thousands of DNA markers from hundreds of individuals uh, and recreate figures that uh, you see in science and nature and just talk about how uh, um, how, what, the, what the figures mean and uh, what the implications of these figures are, are um, for, for communities. Right. But most of the work uh, was spent in discussion, uh, cultural, ethical, legal, social implications of doing genomics with indigenous communities and discussions about that. Right. So uh, this was what happened almost every day uh, after wet lab um, dry lab, other uh, hands-on activities. So we had discussions about classic papers like DNA on loan by Arbor and Cook, about how a DNA, so this is the idea that a DNA sample does not belong to the researcher, it does not belong to the university, it belongs to the participant who provided the sample, and it's just on loan to the researcher and the university, and the implications of that thought process. Uh, we had discussions about um, what it's like to do genomics research with indigenous communities. And a quote from Kim Talbert, if you're going to be working with indigenous communities on genetics, you have to be willing to make lifelong relations. And why she says that is because you're, you know, we're generating data and we have to make sure that that data that we generate uh, does not do harm to that community. And that's not something that ends when the project is over. That's a lifelong commitment. So we have those discussions. We have other discussions about um, what it's like to work in uh, uh, predominantly white institutions and associations. So just for example, um, 
Here is uh, the makeup of the American Society of Human Genetics. Um, it's a little bit old. This is back in around 2018. Uh, here's the makeup of biological anthropology. And the, the demographic makeup is, is clear, right? Uh, and how sometimes this uh, homogenous group doing work can sometimes appear neutral or objective uh, when it's really not. It's just that of the predominant group doing that work. And there are ways that we can bring our lived experiences to our science and how subjectivity can actually strengthen our science. Right? Uh, we would have projects uh, after that about, you know, indigenizing the lab. So we would have a, a fun little project where we would take white lab coats and we would decorate them with beads or art from uh, participants, cultures, and tribes. Right? Um, just to, you know, have a clear example of how you can bring your experiences to science. Right? It's not objective. It's not neutral. Uh, and that, uh, you know, you can do this uh, in other ways as well. You can think about what questions you want to ask. That would be different from uh, probably the predominant society. So uh, that is uh, the SING workshop. You know, we've, been, we've had 10 different cohorts now, over 180 participants. Uh, it started off mostly in Illinois in 2011. You could recognize Illinois by the weird protein sculptures. Uh, but then after a while, uh, the program started to move around the U.S. Uh, and so we had one at the University of Arizona in 2017 focused on cancer genomics, uh, one at University of uh, Washington at the Intellectual House, which is this beautiful structure uh, that had a focus on pharmacogenomics and the ancient one. Um, and then um, in, again, uh, Flagstaff this past summer. And so it's really an uh, amazing program because every year we have it, we have different students from different fields, ranging from political science to genomics or computer science or bioengineering. And so the different makeups always uh, result in different conversations. So it's very iterative um, and we have different things happen every year. Right? Uh, other communities, indigenous communities started noticing what we were doing with Sing USA. And they were like, oh, this sounds like something we want to do. Uh, and so uh, Mally Hudson and Phil Wilcox started Sing Aotearoa in 2016. Um, Kim Talbert uh, was at the University of Texas in Austin, but moved to University of Alberta. And so she started Sing Canada in 2018. Um, Sing Australia started in 2019. Seeing Mexico had been planned for many years, but because of the pandemic, it just happened this um, last winter um, in 2023. Um, and then there are a few other communities that are thinking about potentially uh, developing a SING program, right? But the point is, it's not us saying, oh, there there's needs, needs to be a SING over there or a SING over there. It's grassroots led by indigenous folks in the region. So each thing has its own unique flavor, let's say, uh, where they're interested in different questions that are local. Right. Uh, around 2016, a group of Singh faculty said, okay, training is great, but what we also want to do is start to change uh, the culture of science. We want to start to uh, develop policies for doing ethical research. Uh, we want to start pointing to studies that maybe didn't do it quite right and offer better solutions for doing that type of research. And so we got together at the, the University of Wisconsin in Madison and we started the SING Consortium. And so uh, we mapped out a few papers and we were successful in getting those papers published. And so one of the main ones that we worked on were on ethics and paleogenomics, right? Because at the time you were able to sequence ancient genomes uh, but there were no ethics or regulatory systems associated with sequencing ancestors, right? uh, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Uh, we worked on developing frameworks for doing ethical uh, on genomics with indigenous communities. Right? And then we you know, pointed to a couple of studies that could do better. Right? 
So one of the things we focused on uh, was paleogenomic data. And when you are, those of you that do um, uh, research with living communities of humans, knows that you, have, you know that you have to go through IRB approval. Right? Uh, well, for uh, ancestors or ancient individuals, you don't have to go through IRB <laughs> approval. There's NAGPRA, which does provide a little bit of regulation, but outside of that, uh, researchers could, would, would be able to take samples from museums, sequence the ancestor uh, that may have impacts on present-day community members, but there is no regulation at all. And that combined with NIH uh, policies of open data and make, sharing your data made this problem even worse. Right? So uh, we were having discussions about uh, how the, uh, the field was developing uh, so quickly that you could do things in paleogenomics that you couldn't do just the year before, right? And so how studies that were published with the data out there may not fit with the original intentions of the study if it was used again in another study. Uh, for example, uh, BioBakery uh, allows researchers to do metagenomics, where you can't just identify the, the human DNA variation, but you can look at the pathogens and the microbes associated with that individual as well. Right? And that may be something that uh, um, indigenous communities that partnered on a project may not want. We don't know. Right? So um, another important thing that has come up is a lot of this open data has been downloaded by public companies and used in their services, saying, hey, take our DNA test. We can see if you match the ancient one or uh, another an ancestor um, from somewhere in the Americas. Right? And that, I know for a fact, is not something that some of the partnering communities that I've worked with uh, like. Right? They prefer that not happen. And so uh, people, faculty associated with Singh, have been working on these problems. Right? A lot of them that started off as participants are now assistant professors or associate professors. Uh, and they are working to make changes, right? So just a couple of weeks ago, um, Alyssa Bader and Matt Anderson, who are Singh faculty, uh, published a framework that is uh, based on um, indigenous epistemologies, uh, a relational framework about how to um, work with microbiome data right, from indigenous communities. So microbiome are all the uh, microbes uh, in your gut or in, um, on your skin, other areas in your mouth, um, and how to work with this data and protect it as you would uh, human data. Uh, there are other researchers, such as Crystal Sosi, who's an assistant professor at Arizona State University, uh, Maui Hudson, it's, who's at University of Waikato, Joe Aracheta, uh, who's at Native Biodata Consortium, and Keolu Fox, who's at University of California, San Diego, working hard to change the culture of STEM to uh, promote indigenous data sovereignty. Right. Uh, and so there are great papers that are just coming out now. One is having a, a framework uh, for uh, indigenous data sovereignty in something that a blockchain enabled um, database, right. which is pretty cool. Biocultural labels is one that I particularly like, and this is where genomic data is still open, but there are meta tags or labels that communities can say how they want this data to be used or not used. It could be like you know, no commercialization or only for population history, not for medical purposes, whatever, whatever the communities want. Right? And so uh, I think this is, uh, you know, all things coming out of indigenous scholars and scientists, uh, a lot of them associated with Singh. So Singh has been super successful globally and is doing great now. Uh, I stepped down as director last year. Uh, Matt Anderson and Nana Bagarison are directors right now. Uh, but what I noticed is back at the University of Illinois, uh, some of these messages about doing uh, equitable, equitable and inclusive science uh, were not penetrating, right? And I didn't see these changes happening at my home institution, right? Uh, and so I had been talking for years with one of my colleagues, Jenny Davis, who's a linguist director of American Indian Studies program uh, and is from the Chickasaw Nation, about 
doing something locally, right? And so it was um, last year that we were able to finally get the Center for Indigenous Science at the University of Illinois off the ground. So this is a partnership between the Illinois um, uh, Institute for Genomic Biology and the American Indian Studies Program, uh, but it's funded by the Provost uh, Office of Vice Chancellor for DEI, Office of Vice Chancellor for uh, Research and Innovation, uh, a few other units are all contributing to these efforts. Right? And so we're trying to make a space on campus that is uh, comfortable for indigenous community members as well as students and faculty on campus. Uh, and we're trying to change the narrative of how you can do science uh, by one of the first things we did last year and this year is um, sponsor an indigenous science speaker series. So we're having indigenous scientists uh, coming in from Colorado, um, uh, Arizona, Greenland, uh, all over the place to come talk about their indigenous science research that is community-based or community-engaged uh, and not extractive to provide models for students and faculty about how you can do this type of work. There are models out there that you can follow. Uh, and so uh, that is largely where we are now. Uh, and so just for that, this part of the talk, um, the take home message is, you know, we're trying to increase the number of indigenous PIs that can serve as role models through SING uh, and the Center for Indigenous Science, as well as develop support and train, uh, support networks for trainees and scientists um, through uh, programs like IDEAS, uh, as well as these other programs and uh, create culture change in STEM fields that are inclusive and equitable. All right, so now with the next, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, we got started a little bit late. Yeah, right? uh, I just wanted to give an example of uh, community-engaged research uh, that we have completed in our lab. And the model that I followed uh, was uh, developed by the SYNC Consortium. Right? And so I love this figure that uh, uh, was developed uh, that explains the model or the framework uh, in, um, in a, a nice compact way. What's nice about it is what's at the center of the research is not the university, but is the native nation, uh, their sovereignty and their research regulation. That's at the core of the research and that's what we always try and adhere to. Uh, we have um, aspects that are, we feel are important to this type of work. Uh, that includes cultural competency, so researchers need to know about uh, who they're working with and the history of the tribes. Um, uh, transparency, which we've already talked about. Uh, capacity building, which seeing is a good example of, uh, and dissemination. So uh, if um, uh, parts, people in the tribe are contributing to the work, uh, they should be co-authors. Right? Uh, dissemination should always be something that is uh, co-production co of knowledge. Right? You work with uh, community members to co-produce something that everyone agrees on before you disseminate it, not before. Right? Um, I think ideas that are easy for everyone to grasp, I think just confronted with other pressures, uh, uh, things some sometimes slip. Uh, so the project I want to talk about is with a uh, tribe in California, the Mwekma Ohlone tribe, uh, where uh, around 2015 or so, the San Francisco Public Utilities uh, wanted to build an outreach center in uh, Sanol, uh, which is in the Bay Area, um, East Bay. Uh, and so the most likely descendant was in the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. Uh, and so the Mwek Maloney, after thinking about all these different possibilities, said, okay, uh, we'll allow you to do the construction, but any ancestors we find, uh, we want to be in control of who the cultural resource management firm is, who are the archaeologists that are driving the project, uh, and we want to be able to, to learn from our ancestors, so we want to use scientific techniques like um, isotope analysis, uh, ancient DNA or paleogenomics analysis, other types of analyses. Uh, and so um, I'll give more of an uh, idea of the team here in just a minute, uh, but I want to talk about the Mwekma Ohlone tribe and their history for a little bit, because the Mwekma Ohlone are state-recognized, but 
in the past, they used to be federally recognized as the Verona Band. But there are um, uh, actions that anthropologists have taken that um, uh, were harmful. Right? So Alfred Krober, maybe some, somebody that a lot of folks recognize. Uh, he had worked with uh, folks in the Verona Band and uh, Ohlone ancestors uh, um, for a while, and he ended up saying in a publication, uh, the Ohlone are extinct for all practi practical purposes. And so uh, this, uh, who knows what happened, somehow this information got to Sacramento, uh, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and somehow the federal recognition of the Verona Band and the Mokmaloni tribe was lost. Right? I, it's hard for me to really figure out what happens because I, I can't find anyone that really has a good answer. Uh, but uh, the federal recognition was lost and it wasn't until the 1980s that the Mokmaloni in earnest started to try and regain this federal recognition. Right. Uh, other anthropologists, uh, mostly uh, linguists and archaeologists, had hypotheses about population movements in California. And so there is the hypothesis that this whole green area are Panutian speakers. And the idea was that Panutian speakers moved into this area uh, fairly recently and displaced all of the peoples that are in purple, that are like a little bit of a ring over around the Panutian speakers, right? And so uh, there were hypotheses about the Ohlone had only been in the Bay Area for 500 years because they replaced other people, um, Hokan speakers that were there before. And so this is something that the Mwakma Ohlone knew was not true because they have oral histories, they have community knowledge about how they had been in place uh, for a long time. And so um, when the Mwak Maloney had the opportunity to use this research uh, for their purposes, uh, they were able to choose the cultural research management firm, which was far western, and they chose Brian Bird as the archaeologist, who himself is an indigenous archaeologist. And he, was, he did an amazing job of doing community-based uh, engaged research. Uh, um, Alan Leventhal is the tribal historian, and so San Jose State University uh, is in the area where the, uh, the research took place. Uh, the Moak Maloney were at the center of the tribe. These are tribal council members, uh, Monica Arellano and Char uh, Charlene Nijime. Uh, I had been working with the group, as I'll show you here in a minute, for a number of years, and so they wanted us to do the paleogenomics, uh, and then we work with um, Stanford University, Noah Rosenberg's lab, who um, are on the cutting edge of genetics research and developing new ways of doing genetic analyses. And so I just wanted to point this out in that uh, the project and the request to work on this research took place in around 2016, but we had already been working with the Mwak Maloney since 2011, right? Uh, talking with them about ancient DNA research, uh, members of the Mwak Maloney came to the SING program in 2011 and 2013, right? So we had already had time to establish a trusting relationship. And so community-engaged research, community-based research takes time. It doesn't just happen right away. It's not on the NSF schedule of five years and then you're done, right? It takes a long time to establish this. And so this is an important to a topic because a lot of my students want to do community engaged work, right? But I'm like, okay, let's figure out what we can do, but sometimes these projects can take a decade. You don't want to be in grad school for a decade, right? Uh, and so uh, we, we find a way to uh, have them learn about community engaged work and still complete their project in a timely manner, right? Uh, for the project, um, the Ohlone excavated every ancestor, uh, and they would often have tribal youth come and, and watch and see and learn about their ancestors. Uh, and so this was not a one-time experience. This happened a lot, and this is part of community-engaged research. 
uh, we wanted to try and keep the, re uh, the tribe at the center of the research, but the samples for paleogenomic analysis had to come back to Illinois because that's where the ancient DNA lab was. Right? But what we did using non-human DNA, uh, in this case salmon, uh, we recorded the entire process. And so we're doing this for a number of communities that we're working with where, so they can see what actually happens in the lab, uh, even uh, though they're not there. Right? If there's a way to do ancient DNA analysis uh, uh, at a tribe, uh, we're, that's, that would be great. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, ha I know a few people trying to figure that out. Uh, and so uh, all the genomic analyses that uh, we generated are consistent with continual and deep habitation. Uh, I don't have time to show all of the results, but I just wanted to point out that uh, everything that we, all the analyses that we did kind of pointed to the same thing. I'll just point to a few results. Uh, this is a principal components analysis. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, each of these symbols represents, uh, is a genetic representation of an individual. The closer the symbols are to each other, you can think about as being more closely genetically. Uh, the farther, the more distantly they are genetically. Right? Uh, and so all of the ancestors in the Bay Area that go back to about 2,000 years in age all cluster up here in two different archaeological sites that are right next to each other. Uh, Muak Maloney present day community members that we analyzed uh, are these blue squares. So you would think that they would be up here with these ancestors, but they have experienced the impacts of European colonization. So they have European ancestors. Right? So um, you can see that they're kind of pulled towards these ancestors, but they're not clustering with them because of these impacts. Uh, we also looked at ancestry components, and all of the ancestors in the Bay Area uh, belong to this blue component. And we look, when we looked at present day communities that have this blue component, it was the Muwekma Ohlone that had the highest percentage of this blue component. So this information, along with the archaeological information, along with the community knowledge, all together uh, pointed to this uh, ancestor de um, descendant link in the Bay Area. Uh, with the help of Brian Bird, uh, the Muck Maloney created a documentary about this that you can watch on PBS that gives the tribe's uh, vision of what actually happened here um, and why they wanted to do the analysis that they did. Uh, you can go to, on PBS and type in uh, Time Has Many Voices and you can watch it. Uh, I recommend you do that. Um, and this work was uh, very popular. So it was uh, all over the press, New York Times, lots of other places. Uh, one of the ways that uh, Alan Leventhal, the uh, tribal uh, um, historian, uh, talks about using this information is with all of this po uh, pop popular press, uh, it can put pressure on uh, politicians to help uh, grease the wheels for, wheels for federal recognition or do what they can to move things along uh, rather than have it proceed at a snail's pace. So uh, in summary, uh, with this research, we were able to co-produce knowledge uh, through community-engaged work, uh, and then we were able to find a link between present-day community members and ancestors that fit uh, other knowledge that already existed within the community, as well as the um, archaeology uh, that um, was generated during the project. And with that, I just want to thank a number of people um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.
with many other groups that they've been declared extinct but are, are not? Uh, I, I've heard uh, similar stories about the, the Taino uh, in Puerto Rico, um, uh, as well as other communities. Uh, in California, it was particularly horrific because of the, the missions. Uh, and so uh, missions were, uh, I think I've heard, equivalent to slave labor, where um, people that, indigenous people that were brought into the missions probably didn't live longer than seven years after they were brought in. Uh, and so uh, it did result in, in this, um, what uh, many people call a, a genocide. Yeah. So, um, but there are still, you know, uh, changes that happen because of impacts of European colonization, but that doesn't mean that uh, the community or the culture or the people are extinct, right? They are just impacted um, and definitely changed by, by this process. And um, you have written eloquently about the problems of freezer anthropology. Um, and however, um, the argument seems to be falling on deaf ears. I am thinking most particularly of that paper that came out maybe 18 months ago, um, demonstrating links between uh, the remote Pacific and the Americas, and these were legacy connections collected um, in both remote and near Oceania back in the 60s, so they cannot possibly have consented to the work that was done. Um, it's not an isolated example. So making the ethical case that you make in the nicest possible way isn't working. So I'm wondering, I, I, I've been trying to think through ways to change that, and I can think about changing IRB so you can't get approval for anonymized samples, changing the reviewer base such that reviewers reject things and use these kinds of legacy collections, or something else I haven't thought of. What have you thought of that I haven't thought of? Ah, great. Yeah, yes. so it is, it is a situation that is in process. And there are a group of us that I think are doing what we can uh, but then there's a group of researchers out there that are uh, it's basically window dressing. So they're making it look like they're doing what they need to do, but without a sincere effort. Uh, and how do you change that? I think there's, uh, I think it takes time. I think it takes um, uh, uh, multiple steps. So I know for NSF right now, I'm on a um, uh, panel, I won't say which panel, uh, but uh, one of the things that researchers are required to do now is have an ethics statement in their proposal, which, you know, when I last reviewed just a few years ago, that wasn't a requirement. Uh, and so I think as times change, uh, I know students are interested in doing more community-engaged, inclusive and equitable work rather than the um, uh, helicopter research, uh, but that could be bias because students who want to do that work are of course going to come to my lab. Uh, I think there are, um, you know, journals that are now requiring um, uh, that uh, proof of engagement um, to a certain degree, right? I think more can be done. I think the process has started. Uh, I think it's growing. Uh, I think we got a lot of work we still have to do. Do you have any other ideas? Yes, I'll just say the Okay. Um, yeah, it's kind of a non-answer.